Olivia, is it possible that we've lost the sound? We don't hear anything.
isolate effects of processes such as eco-engineering species, conditions such as sea level rise, and even a child in you knows how to dredge and dump sediment. Johan, you are live. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to our uh, afternoon plenary uh, uh, talk, uh, which uh, we have here now. In fact, uh, two uh, talks. Uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, uh, Martin Kleinhans uh, from the University of Utrecht. Uh, Living myself on a delta, I know actually uh, how important uh, this is, uh, what you're going to see here. Uh, we are living here in uh, the Netherlands to a large part on a delta plane. And what you're going to see uh, in this presentation is really about how this evolved uh, over time and uh, also uh, how you, uh, ha how it has been protected uh, over time. It's a, a remarkable piece of uh, work, uh, uh, which is quite unique in the world, in fact. So let me uh, uh, stop here and uh, welcome uh, Martin Kleinhans, uh, who is Professor for Biogeomorphology at uh, the Earth Science uh, um, Institute here in uh, Utrecht. Uh, so uh, yeah, Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'll start sharing the screen now. And can you see it now? Yes, we can. Excellent. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about the Dutch Delta, which is world famous because the Dutch claim that they are also excellent water workers, living with water and building dikes and making land and all that. So I uh, will be talking about the development of the Delta in the past, but also in the future, given climate change that's coming to us. This is the sort of landscape that I am studying. They're called living landscapes, living uh, estuaries and deltas. And I call them living because you can see there's water involved, there's sand involved and mud, but also plants. Plants have a large role in forming the landscape because they capture the mud and they even create land. They do sort of well, sedimentation is the wrong word, but they build peat domes and as such, they can raise the land above the sea level. And this example here in Wales is actually sort of a small scale uh, analog for what happened in the Netherlands, where we had lots of peat, but also some sand and mud. I'm going to talk about how the Dutch have created their delta and also how this landscape may change into a waterscape again and going down, or maybe we can do something about it. And it's not going to be a very positive talk, I'm afraid, because we are worried. So about five, six thousand years ago, the sea level in the Holocene was still rising and the country had flooded. What is now present day, the country you can see outlined in black. But the, 
sedimentation kept up with sea level rise at this point. So we see in green the mudflats that developed, some sort of wadden sea, you could say, for the entire country. In brown is where peat developed, and then there's a river coming through. And the yellow and orange areas, they're inherited relief from the last and four last glacial uh, times. And then uh, a thousand years later, you can see that the country is basically filled up nearly entirely with peat and mud and our coastal uh, sand ridges here, where at present the uh, capital of the city is located, or the residency of the government actually, The Hague, and Rotterdam in the estuary here. And this is actually the delta. We call the Netherlands a delta, but only this bit here has a big river which brings in sediment. So that is actually the only bit of delta in here. And it is really a delta. This is a map of reconstructed channel belts, the positions where channel sediment is being deposited, and the color, which you don't need to read, but the color indicates age. You can see that about over the past 8,000 years, the river flip-flopped all over the place. It evolved to many locations, and as such, it really is a delta. And especially this bit here is interesting. It's the abandoned course of the Rhine, which the, in the north, in the, to the top left of the image, it built a little bit of a delta, but it is actually the northern boundary of the Roman Empire. And this used to be an estuary or, well, a little bit of a delta, but really an estuary. And here you can see a close up in an elevation map. And what's important here is that the city of Leiden has been built <laughs> on top of the channel, the channel belt. The, um, it has been flanked by levees. That's also clastic sediment but around this. Very closely, actually, you see lots of bigger, deeper holes where the peat is being removed for fuel and for salt. So actually, this is a bit of a delta and there's some sedimentation going on, but a lot of the Netherlands has been built up from peat. So if we then look at a map of about uh, three and a half thousand years ago, we see that the Netherlands is at its largest. Nearly the entire country has been filled up with sediment and built up by peat. <coughs> and then the humans come. On the right map, we see two things happening. The first is that all the brown peat is changed to green. There's clay everywhere because there have been many ingressions from the sea. And also there's clay in the fluvial area because of deforestation in Germany, and that brought mud to the delta. So our natural landscape is actually mostly mud from deforestation. So we see that the southwest of the country became an archipel, an island archipel. The north became a barrier island area, the Warden Sea, and this, this lake has been breached open. So a lot of land was actually lost when people started messing here. And these, these big blue uh, ponds over here, that's where peat has been dug and uh, where the land has subsided. This is a close up map of a satellite image. You can still see the scars of all these inlets, all these dike breaches. So around 1100 in the late Middle Ages, all the country became banked. And two, 300 years after that, it was ingressed everywhere. This is one of the most famous. 1421, St. Elizabeth flood and a big area flooded. It was the area of one of the two potential capitals of the Netherlands, Dordrecht. And you haven't heard from it because Amsterdam became the capital, because this area was lost due to a flood. And they call it a natural disaster, but it wasn't. It was actually, there was a civil war going on. They didn't maintain the dikes, but moreover, they had drained the land, it subsided. They had cut out the peat for salt and for fuel, and therefore it subsided more. And what you see here on this painting is actually that it is not such a big flood as has been later depicted in, in paintings. Here you see people having the time to move their stuff out during low tide. They even had the time to break down churches. There were some deaths. You can see a head on the left that's floating in the water. It's clearly dead. But apart from that, this was not a natural disaster. It was a man-made disaster. And yet the Dutch say everywhere on the planet that, the Dutch, that God created the world, but the Dutch made Holland. It's not true. The Dutch made Holland drown and then did an Orwellian revision of history. And it's still going on, unfortunately. Here is a map of the subsidence that's presently going on and it's expected also for the coming decades to go on. One centimeter per year in the areas that subside faster. And it's usually the lower lying flatter areas where lots of peat and mud have been deposited. 
The reasons are groundwater management for agriculture and built up, but also the peat has been dug away and it's also decayed because of groundwater management. Moreover, because with all the dikes, there is no renewed sedimentation that would, kept, that would keep the delta up, up to the water level. And this is the main error in our thinking on this planet at the moment. The delta is not a thing that you can stamp on, that you can live on. The delta is a process. And if you kill the processes, stop the processes, then the delta, which is nothing but a precipitate of those processes, it goes down, it goes under. That is a problem. It's not necessarily the case that sea level rise is going to drown deltas down. Here you see a curve of the sea level rise of the Holocene in the Netherlands. Vertical axis is in meters, horizontal in thousands of years. And uh, so we have seen a lot of sea level rise in the past. The future looks like this. This is the climate projections, and it doesn't really matter which ones they are. But the thing here is that the horizontal time axis is really much stretched out compared to that of the whole Holocene. So if I compress this picture to see what happens uh, on the same time axis, then we see that it's going to be as rapid in the RCP 8.5 scenario as it was in the early Holocene. And in the early Holocene, the Netherlands drowned. In the late Holocene, it grew up under the waves, under the water, Despite the sea level rise, there was still enough sedimentation going on so that the delta came out of the waves. But in the future, sea level rise could be as fast as this, and then we are in trouble. And then the subsidence, the land is also falling. So you can see we have a bit of a problem in the Netherlands and many other deltas. So are we ostriches? Are we sticking our heads in the sand? Yes, we built the delta works, but as Michiel van der Broeke showed yesterday, the delta works were built for 40 or 50 centimeters sea level rise. And they won't be doing their jobs anymore in uh, the coming decades. So are we really sitting ducks, Dutch ostriches? Fact is, if we stick our heads in the sand now, then our grandchildren will need to get their heads out of the water. That's the main worry. And yet there's a discourse in the Netherlands that we are doing well. We are the main water engineers on the planet. We are doing mediation. We are doing uh, nature in the North Sea. We're doing economic activities and we have the safest delta on the planet. That is what we say. But look at facts, actually. And what we say is that we do polveren. That's a Dutch word, which means that we are really talking about everything and taking the middle way, moderated. But the simple fact is that we allow ships that are bigger than the rivers. We need to dredge out the rivers and the estuaries in order to let in the ships. We prioritize economy in many, many ways like this, and then comes safety and only then comes nature. So we see a lot of biodiversity loss in the Netherlands. Here's an example. This is the port of Rotterdam, and the red colors indicate that we have lost many meters of bed because it's been dug out for shipping purposes over the past year. So this was once upon a time a natural estuary with islands, bars and everything and, and peat and mud and everything around it, and it's been dug out. It's no longer a delta, it's an estuary. And the difference is that an estuary is basically something where there's still accommodation space and a delta is building out into the sea. Sediment removal is actually accelerating for the purposes of these bigger ships. Here you see the cumulative sediment removal per year from the bathymetries in megatons. So on an annual basis, we are removing 10 megatons of sediment. That is really a lot that goes into the meters over those large channels. So what will the effects of five meters of sea level rise be? That would happen, for example, in 2150, let's say uh, 120 years from now, 130 years from now, if we have no Paris situation, if we don't stick to the Treaty of Paris, then we'll have lots of salinity intrusion. Many people think that dikes are about the horizontal, about keeping the water out. But in fact, the other problem is that the saline seawater goes under the soil, which is really weak soil, and then intrudes into the country. So that means our entire freshwater agricultural economy will be in trouble. Also, the deepened channels will see tidal amplification. Tidal waves will have less friction coming into the country, which means 
further rising sea levels or water levels land inwards. It's already happening in Antwerp because of the dredging. Then the sea level rise it will the sea level rise will be faster and furious uh, by that time. It's actually rising steeply here. There has been talks of super dikes. The Netherlands have built their delta works. They can deal with this, but the super dikes cost as much as we can spend if we had no other trouble on our hands. But if we have salinity intrusion, tidal amplification, corona, other diseases, heat waves, you name it, then we can't afford super dikes really. And that is really the worrying situation. So we are now thinking, speculating, planning, scheduling, and thinking what to do in the further future. And this is sketches done for Deltaris by, um, uh, to work with the Delta Committee in the Netherlands. The four main directions of thinking what to do with the Netherlands. You can see three of them are about building walls around the country, which is basically doing what we have been doing for a thousand years, build dikes. One of them, it's actually about letting go certain parts of the country, developing different economies and then building dikes around the city so they become islands, an archipel. If you then think about what the Netherlands looked like once upon a time, it was a lot of country with a lot of plants and a lot of sediment. Where have those gone to? The plants were dig out, but the sediment is still there. Maybe we can do something with the sediment, and especially in the southwest and the northeast of the country, a lot of sediment is in motion, both mud and sand. And perhaps that can be used to raise land to follow the sea level. So if we look at this uh, sea level curve again of the Holocene, we can see that with a rise of two meter or one meters per hundred years, the land drowns, but with slightly slower sea level rise rates, the land actually erodes. We have the waves wiping the sand to the coast. We have the M4 tidal component in the North Sea, which also helps bringing in the sand. We have muds and, mud and plants, and we could actually maybe even think about peat again. So with lower sea level rise rates, we can raise the land. We can do land level rise. That's one option. But aren't we already doing that? You could say, that the sand engine is such an effort. This is world famous. It's called building with nature. Here we are not building a concrete dam. We are actually dumping a load of sediment off the Hague on the coastline. And we hope that the sand is spread by natural processes. This is actually working. But this is only one location on the coast. It's protecting the coast, but not the inland. Where are we actually interfering when we do this kind of building with nature? And nature here is a system. It has causes, which you could also name boundary conditions. It has the complex processes, and complex processes are in this case the land formation of sedimentation, channel evulsion, uh, peat building, that sort of thing. And then there are the effects, and that is what turns out to be the landscape. And now what we have here is the changing climate conditions. We really need to stick to the Paris Climate Treaty in order to save this delta. And we are messing with the open dynamic lowland systems, the living landscape that's no longer living. We're not building with nature because nature doesn't get the chance to do what it can do. And what we would like to have is the effect of delta stasis. But a static delta doesn't exist, delta is a process. So we are really framing with nature. So the framing of building with nature is a bit dangerous, I think. It suggests that we are as clever as the beaver who is building with nature who's really affecting the landscape. But in fact, what it does is amplify the process that we are already in of a drowning delta. So here we have this beautiful estuary in Wills again. We see the sediment coming from the mountains, lots of sediment available there, but there's a rising sea level. So this landscape might drown. And yet there are also plants here. Well, this is obvious, isn't it? I mean, any earth scientist can say what needs to be done here. We need to make sure that that sediment is sourced and captured here. We need to make sure that the plants are actually growing. And then we can raise the land. The problem is, of course, this dike. So if you want to do that, you would also need a transition in agriculture and you would need different ways of managing the land such that the buildings can no longer be built there, are no longer insured against floods, but are built elsewhere. Actually, Aberystwyth is a lot further south. So here is not a problem, but in the Netherlands, that is a problem. And it can be done, this land level rise. There are examples already after the middle evil uh, floods that we had because we built dikes. 
So this is that famous flood again, 1421. A major inland delta built from all the sediment of the Rhine that was captured in this area that had been flooded, where these little ships sit. There was actually agriculture going on. The city of Dordrecht is right uh, there. And also here, a more recent example in the Western Skeld estuary. This area is called the Verdronken uh, Land van Saftingen, meaning the drowned land of Saftingen, but it's actually now the mountain of Zeeland. It's the highest bit of the whole area here. It's meters above sea level. And it only happens in 300 years. So we can do three meters in 300 years. That's about one centimeter per year. That's the slower sea level rise rates. We're also investigating this experimentally, of course, also numerically with models, but experiments are nice to do because they are real matter. This is the metronome. It's a flume that can do tides. And here we see a 20 meter long by three meter wide flume that has an entire estuary in it. And here we can feed in the river with river flow with walnut, crushed walnut shell as mud. There's already a sand bed and seeds of plants. And in the sea, we can do constant sea level or rising sea level. We can do waves. You can actually see a bit of a barrier island here. And also the scaling here is about one in a thousand in space and time. But the sediment mobility is exactly the same as in nature. That is the critical scaling. I can talk for hours about that, but I won't. Here you can see it move. If you ignore the Nachtwacht in front of all the builders, you can see in the back that the flume is actually moving up and down. That is driving a tidal flow. The essence of tidal flow is that it goes back and forth, not up and down, back and forth. People tried up and down for 130 years and they always failed completely to produce estuaries in the lab. But like this, it works. So that's nice because now we have bars, self-developing bars with mud flats. For example, the top two uh, left images, they show during one tidal cycle, how a bar is flooded and just not flooded because the mud raised it above mean sea level. And you can also see what happens if we don't do mud. We can now do control experiments. Top estuary is only sand. The middle one has a low mud supply. And the bottom one has a high mud supply. And what the effects of mud are, as expected, is that it funnels the estuary, it fixes the estuary, and it fills the estuary. So that's good news. It gets even more beautiful, but then I'm biased, of course, if we add plants. And here again, we do multiple plant species, and it's not a trick to scale the size of the plant, but it's to scale the effect of the plant, which is the degree to which it sticks the sediment together, but also the hydraulic resistance to the flow. And on the left image, you can actually see that it resists erosion. There's a bank erosion going on here, but the steep banks suggest that the vegetation is trying to keep that at bay. And here you can see multiple generations in the vegetation, also different species in the different colors. So they have different niches and habitats. Absolutely fascinating to see what goes on here. Here we can even see on the landward side, the flood delta, if you like. Uh, no, not the bayhead delta, it's officially called. This is levees, levees next to a sandy river channel and the floodplains with decaying vegetation and different species in there that actually built some sort of organic muck, which we, for the fun of it, call peat in these experiments. So what these things show us is that you need space, space in order to do sedimentation and develop nature that then helps to raise the land. So we need more room in our estuaries. We need to set back the dikes. They need to move backwards, these big dikes, and then we can actually do sedimentation. Now, of course, that's a problem for the present activities because we have agriculture going on and we have building there. So we need new ways of dealing with spatial planning and agriculture, and then we can actually make this happen. One small scale or large scale test is going to happen in Groningen actually. This is the dike and we're going to open it up in the future, hopefully, and let it do its own sedimentation. And several smaller scale pilots have already been conducted and it seems to work well. But no one wants it in the backyard. That's another main problem. We all are fine with nuclear oil and coal plants in our backyards, but the windmills are a problem and flooding the area when we have just won from the sea with the Delta works is out of the question. And yet that seems to be what we need now. It needs to be in our backyards now because sedimentation takes time and we need to catch up with the present sea level. It's already been subsided too much and then we can maybe keep up with future sea level rise. 
And whose backyard is it anyway? The really painful thing to keep saying, to have that we have to say as Earth scientists, is that if we want to seriously mitigate climate change and adapt to the climate change we're going to get anyway, it's going to be painful. If we don't feel the pain, we haven't taken serious measures. The problems are such that it's no longer a question whether we can solve these without any pain. And that's really a painful message that no one wants to hear. That's not one that makes Earth scientists very popular. And yet we have to tell the world about it. It's not fun. One of the ways is to bring in stakeholders, which is what I do. So these movies on this website are very short movies that come with a lecture. And during the lecture, we also take people to the metronome experiments. And there we show how the system works and what can possibly be done about the problems that we have. And in these lectures where you can also visit yourself, you can pick your own storyline. If you like, walk through the three minute movies and have some fun. And then below the movies, there's a sort of a, a connecting story with references to the literature that we published about this. With this, I come to the conclusions. The Delta of the Netherlands formed under sea level rise, but is presently a drowning estuary. The subsidence going on at the same speed as fast sea level rise of the future. And future sea level rise is going to be very much a problem if we don't stick to the Paris Treaty. If we do, then we could try land level rise in at least a number of locations. It won't be the only solution. We need many more, including dike and dam building. But for a number of areas, we can maybe keep up at sea level with natural sedimentation. That would allow us to think about other kinds of agriculture. It would be a true building with nature. And this is possible because we have so much sediment in motion around the Netherlands. We could even try peak growth. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Yeah, yeah. thank you thank uh, very much. much. For this uh, presentation, uh, Martin. Martin. And uh, the floor is open for discussion. Can you hear me well, Martin? I think there's sound is. Uh, yeah, OK. Uh, yeah, the floor is open for discussion. Um, this moment, no questions. In the in the in, in the chat room, so I advise uh, we 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 launch this discussion. So I will kindly ask uh, both of you to keep just one microphone open because there is a echo in the meeting. Okay. So. Um, All right. Uh, yeah. Let me maybe ask the first uh, question then uh, here, uh, Martin. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of uh, interesting uh, what you have shown here. Uh, on the one hand, uh, in Netherlands we have these dikes which uh, protect actually a lot of sediment from going out into the North Sea, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, the uh, effect is trying to be counterbalanced by transporting sediment uh, into the sand engines uh, on the coast. Uh, but I presume there's probably still a lot of sediment actually trapped. Uh, in uh, the main delta area at the moment. Uh, um, yeah, how yeah, how does that actually work uh, with all the sediment? Where does all the sediment actually go at the moment? Uh, what's the balance of sediment at this point in time with these dikes uh, protecting the coastline and flooding? The um uh, a lot of the sediment used to come on our embanked floodplains. So they were no longer going on the entire delta floodplain, but on, only within the dikes. And that meant that that land was rising rapidly and some of it has been removed to create more space for the rivers so that we can deal with the bigger river floods due to climate change. At the moment, it seems there's hardly any sediment coming from upstream because of upstream land use changes and dams and other kinds of things. So from the rivers, we are at the moment receiving hardly anything. Now in the sea, a lot of sediment is still in motion, but most of the sand that has been wiped up onto our coastline was wiped up when the sea level was still lower and the wave base could reach the North Sea floor. So that has reduced over time. And also there were some higher areas of sand in the North Sea that have been spread along the coastline. 
So some stretches of our coast are actually eroding, which is the whole reason that they need to put in these, these extra uh, sources of sediment, for example, in the, in the form of a sand engine. But some areas in the northeast and the southwest actually have a surplus of sediment. There's too much mud, and there's too much sand in these systems. And that is where we can actually try and use some of the sediment for better purposes than letting it flow out into the sea. We, we have a question in, in the chat area which says, uh, can the effects of uh, land level rise already be seen in location where the uh, the room for river, space for the river project has been in place? Uh, yes, this is an interesting question. Actually, no, because where the room for the river has been taken place, it's in areas that are dominated by the river and there's hardly any sediment coming in anymore. And at the same time, also the river bed has been lowered by dredging and by natural erosion, which is not really natural, but because of the upstream dams and other engineering works, so what happens is actually that these floodplains, they're not rising or maybe the lows are filling in a little bit of suspended sediment um, and the riverbed is going down. So the natural areas that we also made in the room for the river project are now in uh, trouble because of the drought that we have created with the lowering of the river water. So I'm afraid not. I mean, personally, I'm, uh, I'm always fascinating about this balance between uh, between uh, between the transport of sediment. I mean, and I observed in one of your symposiums that you speak a lot about uh, dredging effects uh, changing completely, the, the, uh, such as in the main transport channel in, in Rotterdam, uh, changing completely the balance of the, of the sediments in other channels. I mean, can you comment a little bit more, more, more in, uh, more in uh, this respect on what is the sensitivity of the system? Yeah, that, that's a major open question. What we see is that these systems, um, we, we try to push in the biggest chips possible, so we keep dredging and dredging, and the dredging basically has a number of effects. One is to remove sediment for a system, from the system or dump it elsewhere, and that means that we fixate channels. Fixating channels means that the dynamics go out of the network, and uh, that means that other smaller channels now fill up. So, for example, in the Western Skelt estuary, we are losing a lot of important intertidal area because the bars and the minor channels are fixated and they grow up, but there's nothing to cut them down. Another issue is that there's indeed a network behavior and we don't understand anything about networks in channels. The very unstable features, these bifurcations can flip flop in other directions. The channels are communicating in different ways, the sediment going in two directions, there's water going in two directions, etc. So that's actually open research going on at the moment. How about uh, how about the uh, the temporary lakes and, and uh, more, uh, more uh, staying system? I mean, uh, I have the experience of a, real, of a natural delta, which is closer to natural where I worked for many years and I've seen that there is a very close interplay between the transfer of sediments in the main channels and uh, the evolution of lakes. Is there, yeah. Do you see such a thing? Um, we see one such a thing in the Netherlands. In most places our lakes have been cut off from the channels by dikes, so we used to have some lakes but no longer. But there is one newly created lake. There's the Haring Fleet estuary, which has been closed off from the sea with a hard dam. And that is now functioning as a lake. So something very interesting going on, that the water levels go up and down due to the tides in and out of Rotterdam, the, the port area, that channel. But it's connected a little bit to the lake, which is static. So you can see that there's going to be back and forth strong flows between the lake and the harbor area. So there are severe erosion problems close to the city of Dordrecht at the moment in one of those channels because basically it's being flossed by tidal currents. It's carved out and uh, it's actually carving into the deepest Holocene harder layers. So there's erosion problems there. And that's uh, the only effect of a lake that I'm aware of that is still at play in the Netherlands. Jan Schoening is asking, uh, is there a network of measurements of sediment within the water column? Um, but that's uh, on our wish list. It's uh, one of the pains of the researchers in the Netherlands 
that we have about 10 times as few measurements as they have, for example, in Germany, where they have an excellent measurement network. And that means that we have some measurements in some places. Incidentally, uh, the Western Skelt estuary is better measured because of the Antwerp uh, uh, complications with international treaties and that sort of thing. Our main measurement point is somewhere in the Meuse and somewhere in the Rhine, and we would like to have 10 times more, and then we can know more. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Let me ask you uh, one more question, Martin. Um, you've said uh, uh, and shown very nicely that uh, the solution is not really in building dams. Uh, now, we have this situation, of course, uh, in deltas in many places around the world, like uh, the Mississippi Delta is one of these examples and cities of New Orleans uh, subsiding. Uh, if you would have a free hand, what would you recommend actually to do, in fact, uh, in areas uh, which are uh, suffering from this problem of subsidence, uh, like in the Mississippi Delta, and possibly also, of course, sea level rise uh, in the future? Yeah, um, colleagues of mine are working hard on that problem because much of that problem is due to the subsidence. And uh, a lot of coastal um, Erosion is happening because of uh, agricultural activities. So in tropical deltas, for example, mangroves have been cut down. So what we need is reforestation with mangroves, if possible at all. And what we need is different ways of getting water into an area for use other than pumping it out of the ground, which makes the ground go down. So what's really needed here is a transformation of the agricultural system. And that is a problem because that costs a lot of money. On the other hand, you can also wonder why this is such a problem. It is, at, especially in, uh, in more tropical countries, it is a problem of poverty. And poverty is a problem of the skewed distribution of wealth, right? So ultimately, the ethical people of our university argue that it is all about the division of welfare in the world. And there are very few people who have far too much money, and there are a lot of people who haven't got enough. And if we were able to distribute that in a different way, if you can transform that system, then it's also a lot easier to transform those other systems. And I know this sounds like an idealist dream, but if we don't do it, we're going to have Dante's hell squared. Let me go a little bit back to the, let's say, uh, this is obviously a very important problem, but let me go a little bit, a little bit to the principles. I mean, in river systems, we see very often that, uh, let's say, human intervention, such as dams or any other uh, works in a, in, in a river, in a mon mountainous river especially, has very strong effects in, uh, in uh, let's say, in, uh, in erosion, resedimentation, uh, which leads to, let's say, to increasing, uh, I don't know, uh, flooding events uh, or, uh, or mass transport uh, or uh, landslides. I mean, do we see such things? Uh, we, we call this typical nick point effects. Huh? So do we see s such effects uh, in a much more subtle system like like uh, like works in a delta environment? Um, I can think of two. And one is the displacement of rivers, uh, which is southern events. And so you may have uh, natural sedimentation in a certain area and when the sediment comes high enough then vegetation can start to grow on, all, on it and you can even develop peat. Develop peat. But um, with natural compaction it, that can actually go faster than the building up of the land. So if the source of the sediment is away from that particular location natural compaction can win again and then at some point the river revolves back into it. So then you tip that system in that direction. And there's another tipping point I'm thinking of in estuaries. There's an elevation difference between salt marsh and mud flat. So salt marsh are able to build up above sea level by sediment capturing and by building uh, organic material build up and all that. But they're not so very resistant against waves. So for some reason there is a wave attack uh, on one of the salt marshes that has been built out towards the uh, channel, then it can flip back a whole distance by wave erosion because there's a cliff that keeps capturing the waves and keeps eroding and then it has to start growing all over again. So there's a couple of places where you see these tipping points. 
My feeling is that there are many more, but there are so much more that we don't really know where they sit. How about the changes in the uh, in the uh, submarine part of the delta offshore? <sighs> That's a good question. I know from historical records there has been a suggestion that at some point the ebb deltas of the Wadden Sea were all nearly gone. And that was because after the faster sea level rise, a lot of that sediment went into the Wadden Sea. So if we raise the sea level rise, you can see that sediment moving in there. So this is not really a question about the tipping point, but it's a question about connectivity and the rates of processes on the ebb delta compared to what goes on in the basin. Yes. And there are many open questions there. Jochen? Yeah, I'm uh, Martin. I'm living uh, almost uh, right next to uh, the location uh, where the Romans used to uh, go into the North Sea, so uh, close uh, to Leiden. And uh, there, if you go there, you actually see well the meandering uh, morphologies uh, from satellite image. But uh, these sands, uh, these meandering sands, actually are being used and excavated for building purposes. Uh, um, yeah, what do you think about uh, this year? Uh, these developments that actually these deposits are being dug out on a significant scale uh, for yeah required building material. There's not a lot of rocks here in the Netherlands uh, uh, and uh, quarries which you can use uh, to get building materials. Uh, yeah, this sand is of course one of the sources. Yeah. There are uh, two answers to that. And the simplest answer is, of course, this is what the English call Pennywise Pound Foolish. But there's another answer. As long as we keep that sand in the build up area and spread it there, then at least that area is high. If we transport the sediment out completely, then we have another problem. Or if you put it into concrete in high buildings, then you have another problem. But it's really funny you mentioned this because in one of the locations where there is still significant sand arriving in our delta, we are dredging it out on a yearly basis and we're getting all the sand out that the River Rhine still transports in it. We're selling it to the market. I have a hard time finding a better word than just plain stupid for that. All right, I think that's a, a concluding remark. Uh, I think uh, it's a fantastic piece of research what's happening there. Uh, there's a lot of tradition in these flume tank uh, experiments at the University of uh, Utrecht. Uh, that was another fabulous example of what you have seen here. So uh, thank you very much for this and continuing this tradition uh, of uh, these flume tank experiments and showing really how yeah, vitally important that is uh, for the Netherlands and many other uh, uh, cities uh, or countries uh, uh, close to coastlines. Uh, so thanks a lot for that. And uh, with that, I would like to hand over to uh, Livio. Uh, Livio. Yes, uh, I would like to let's say to ask uh, Ronald to uh, take over the second part of the of the of the session. All right. Thank you, Livio. Thank you, Jurgen. Thanks, uh, Martin. Uh, my name is Ronald Pijnenburg. I work for the Dutch Research Infrastructure for Solid Earth Sciences, uh, EPOSNL. It is my honor to introduce our next keynote speaker, Massimo Coco. Massimo works at the National Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology in Rome, and he is the uh, director of EPOS, which is the European Research Infrastructure for Solid Earth Sciences. Uh, Massimo will talk, talk about EPOS today. Uh, what it is and how research can co contribute and benefit. So Massimo, with that, I would like to give the virtual floor to you. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. And uh, yeah, let me just share the screen uh, to start my presentation. And I guess that you can see my screen now. So in this presentation, I would like uh, to discuss uh, a general uh, outstanding uh, questions. We, which can is screen. we cannot see, see your screen yet. OK, sorry. Is coming. Yeah. 
Yeah, this, it should be okay now. Yes, it is. Yeah, okay. Sorry for the issue. Uh, in my presentation today, I would like to tackle the general uh, topic of sharing scientific data and scientific products. I will focus on solid earth science and I will present the experience of a research infrastructure, which is EPOS, the European Plate Observing System. Before starting, I would like to make a general uh, uh, remark on the data generation. And I will use, I'm going to use a metaphor for that, uh, considering that the data generation is like the universe. And there are so many actors that are generating data, like uh, uh, in the universe, and they generate data uh, like observatories, uh, individual researchers, experimental facilities, observing systems, uh, monitoring networks, uh, or as well as uh, the broad scientific knowledge and information. So there is a wealth of data that are generated by scientists, and this wealth of data is strongly increasing in recent times. In order to measure and to map and to manage this data, research infrastructures are like a radio telescope. So they sample a small part of the spectrum of the universe, but with some peculiar uh, uh, features. And I would like to anticipate one issue of my conclusion, which is uh, the difficulties of managing the data generated by the so-called the long tail of science. I mean, a researcher in a laboratory of a university, in order to manage and to share the data, uh, needs to undertake so many actions. It's so demanding that this gap has to be taken into account when we try to adopt the principles for sharing data. And the research infrastructures, uh, even if they sample a limited portion of the data generation useful, they are relevant because they can ensure the quality control of the data, the standardization of data and metadata, the metadata curation and integration, the data and the service curation and integration, access to scientific data and scientific products, visualization tools of the integrated data, access to multidisciplinary data, as well as they can foster the generation of new scientific products, and they can manage the data qualification and service qualification. Even if this is a small portion of data generation universe, this portion is well managed and it responds to the requirements for managing scientific data. This has to be done in the paradigm of open science. We all agree that science, open science means open access not only to data funded for research in the public domain, but also open access to literature, access to research tools or IT tools to access and to manage the data. And all these require investment in, over, in IT infrastructure for maintaining open science. If we focus on the data, therefore we open data means the data that anyone can access, use and share, means open data became usable and understandable when made available in a common machine readable format. And open data must respond to some legal framework in order to maintain the intellectual property rights and to protect the accountability of the data providers. So, that is a second uh, component of this framework, uh, that uh, we want to share data in an open access uh, and respecting open science principles. The access to data is for sure a global challenge. Recently, a new acronym has been uh, invented, this uh, FAIR data. Well, FAIR stands for findable, accessible, and I would add that, uh, that to be accessible, the data must be understandable. They must be interoperable uh, because the data should be accessed, funded, but also they can uh, uh, be um, extracted and merged from many different locations. And that they can be reusable, which means uh, archived and stored. And also somehow we can add even a further R to this acronym FAIR, they should be reproducible. So there is, uh, this means that there is nothing wrong in uh, adopting this uh, uh, goal, this uh, horizon 
of fire data management. But of course, there are even if more and more researchers are seeing the value of sharing data and many other countries are adopting open science and open research data policies. Uh, uh, this action is demanding and here once again I would like to focus and to point out uh, which is the central law of research infrastructure. Research infrastructures are uh, the uh, organization, the, uh, the, the, the physical infrastructure that can uh, provide access, uh, virtual access to data but they can also provide physical access to facilities. I mean, downloading the data from uh, data repositories or from a uh, 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 data archive, or to ex do experiments in a lab, uh, accessing to the lab under shared uh, access policies. They allow communication with different stakeholders, and in particular here in this sketch, they can, of course, put together research organization with the academia, Research organization may be mainly committed to operate the research infrastructures and the academia, which is committed to uh, support education and uh, as well as uh, the, 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 the innovation. And also they are of relevance for the private sector and for the society. Therefore, the research infrastructure, they can strengthen the data management and the interoperability. Here, of course, I would like to show you the experience of a particular research infrastructure, which is EPOS, the European Plate Observing System. Uh, EPOS deals with solid earth science, and therefore uh, we are going to share and to integrate data through a federated approach that are relevant for understanding earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, tsunami, tectonics and surface dynamics, uh, deformation and geodetic data, but also experimental laboratories, uh, data from, uh, from the lab, from experimental facilities. You can imagine that solid earth science involves many different communities. Can you imagine uh, to discuss between a seismologist with uh, a geologist, uh, with a geochemist, uh, or with a volcanologist? They are uh, multidisciplinary data, and also the services are targeted to specific data coming from an individual community. And therefore, uh, integrating this data requires a lot of community building, but also, more important, uh, this community is providing service uh, to society. And these services are operational in real time for the surveillance and the monitoring of the national territory for uh, volcanic hazard, uh, seismic hazard, tsunami hazard, uh, landslides, and so on. For these reasons, uh, these data and this uh, research infrastructure are uh, involved uh, for geohazards, but also not only for the natural hazards, but also for the anthropogenic hazards. I mean, uh, for instance, induced seismicity, and therefore they are relevant for the safe exploitation of the georesources. EPOS is uh, a long-term plan for the integration of research infrastructure, existing and future research infrastructure for solid earth science in Europe. And the goal and the mission is to integrate these uh, existing and new research infrastructures into a single distributed research infrastructure, uh, exploiting uh, the innovation coming from uh, e-science innovation and e-science opportunities. Currently, there are 25 countries that are uh, somehow involved in uh, supporting and participating to the data uh, integration. There are six international organizations, 260 national research infrastructure, and nearly 140 research national research organizations. If we put together, we have several petabytes of data. They are, we do not generate less data than a synchrotron or than a physical high energy research infrastructure. But of course, this data came, came from completely different communities and therefore the integration and the management of this data is demanding, is a bit more difficult. Also, we should uh, to take into account that from a scientific point of view, you see here on the abscissa, these uh, data sample are useful for many different processes, earthquakes, volcanoes, georesources, surface dynamics, uh, earth interior, 
And this uh, observation, they are collected in uh, many different ways. They are surface or uh, subsurface observations like uh, geomagnetic observation, seismology, uh, geological uh, induced seismicity or volcano observ uh, observation. But they are also collected uh, underground for the underground laboratories like the geoenergy test beds and uh, from the satellite like uh, the satellite data and the GNSS but they are also reproduced in the lab. So these are natural observations and these are lab experimental observations. All these that you see green in this uh, picture, they are communities integrated in EPOS. And those that you see in purple here are international organizations that are somehow collaborating with EPOS in order to share data and to share the commitment to undertake the vision and the mission of the EPOS research infrastructure. But this picture gives you an idea not only of what does it mean multidisciplinary integration, this can also say what does it mean multidisciplinary research for understanding the natural and anthropogenic phenomena that are relevant in solid earth science. There is another point that we need to clarify, which is uh, so far we have uh, spoken about data in a generic sense, data or products. But let's try to understand that uh, data can uh, mean uh, different things. For instance, raw data, like a seismogram in seismology. Usually raw data are always shared and are uh, pretty much open access, but all, not in all the communities. Or you can have data coming or scientific products coming from nearly automated procedures. Here there is an example of the distribution of hypocenters in a seismic active areas. This is California, it's not Europe. Or the moment tensor of the focal mechanism characterizing the earthquake source. Or they can come from the activity of researchers. Therefore, they are not nearly automated procedures, but there are investigators that are generating these scientific products, usually accessing to raw data, like an interferograms from an earthquake. This is the deformation pattern measured by the satellite data or uh, the repositories of the earthquake rupture models, the source of earthquakes. This is the fault that ruptured during the L'Aquila 2009 earthquake. And uh, the, these are other data products and the distribution of the rupture history during that earthquake, the models of the rupture history models during that earthquake, or the seismic wave propagation in the earth. All these uh, scientific products came from the work and the actions of uh, scientists. But there are also scientific products of a higher level in taxonomy. They are those coming from complex analysis or community shared products. And the two examples are a catalog of the active faults. This is the map of the active faults in California or the seismic hazard map. So this is a scientific products. It uses raw data and the scientific products but it is produced by a community after a validation process. And this is a commitment taken by the scientific community toward the national authorities, the civil protection agencies. You can imagine that if you move in this level of this data, the data open, open access and the open science might have a bit different uh, uh, implementation. And this has to be taken into account. Therefore, uh, open science and open access does not mean free, anonymous access to all the data, possible data, because this is not applicable to reality. And finally, this is software, uh, which can be also open source, but is usually uh, another of the possible elements to be shared and to be provided to users. This, just to clarify you, what does it mean uh, data and uh, keeping in mind that it is different to apply the same data policies to different types of scientific products. What EPOS is doing for integrating this data? Uh, I would like just to present uh, in a nutshell the EPOS architecture. So in Europe, there are a wealth of national research infrastructures that are uh, being deployed by the national authorities 
to, for the surveillance of the national territories, uh, of the local regional uh, um, uh, territories, for the protection from natural hazards, uh, and in some cases for anthropogenic hazards. What EPOS is doing, we want to integrate all this uh, data coming from national and regional research infrastructure into a community action. So we ask the seismologists to integrate their data, the volcanologists to integrate their data, the geodesists, the geologists to integrate their data. And therefore, in this way, we can involve the communities that are committed to generate, curate, and share the data, which are the data providers, obeying to the principles that the good data requires good management of the research data life cycle in, during the entire research data life cycle. This is done in 10 different communities, and these communities are trying to integrate the data, the data products, the software, and the services that can be accessible in a central lab, which is the integrated core services central lab, accessible to the different communities and, the, and the, the, uh, to the different users. And the thematic communities that are currently integrated in EPOS, that is seismology, near fault observatories, GNSS data and products, volcanoes observation, satellite data, geomagnetic observation, anthropogenic hazard and induced seismicity, geological information and modeling, multi-scale laboratories, and the geoenergy test beds that are the underground laboratories. There is a new TCS that is coming on the tsunami data and modeling. So all these communities are participating to the data integration, and this data integration uh, through this federated approach is coordinated by EPOSERIC, which is a European consortium. Uh, currently, 13 countries have already joined the, the consortium, and others are expected to join in the forthcoming years. This is to try to share at the European level the vision of sharing data, for science and for society, and the mission to integrate data by involving the communities and the data providers in the data management at different levels. So the, our experience is that if we focus, for instance, in the data generation, therefore we have the acquisition, the quality control, the metadata and the standardization of metadata. This is a particular experience because means that we are engaging data providers at national level. And we are therefore national research infrastructure. That is a community level integration, which is the adoption of a federated approach. And you can imagine that the experience, the maturity, and also the practices for sharing data is very different among these observations. For instance, the seismologists, Seismology, they are already sharing data uh, without EPOS, but uh, participating to EPOS, they can share the efforts of participating to a data management plan and to sharing data, for instance, with the near fault observatories or the, with the volcano observations. The GNSS data, they are not collected in Europe, they would not exist without EPOS. And the same is the anthropogenic hazard and induced seismicity. So there are very different experiences in the data generation, and there is a mutual benefit in trying to participate together to the efforts of standardization, quality control, and metadata, richness metadata sharing, which is the real effort. But this also requires services, uh, services for qualification, for storage accessibility. And these services are quite demanding because uh, maintaining data, metadata, but also uh, achieving uh, interoperability and services is quite increasing commitment. And this is uh, achieving the fairness, uh, the fair data is a serious demanding uh, activity for the scientific community. And this is came back to what are the FAIR principles. FAIR, again, is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And there are principles. I'm not going to list the principles, all the principles here, but I would simply uh, under, uh, underline, underline that in any case, they are demanding because, for instance, to make the data findable means that the metadata are assigned and you have a persistent identifier or a DOI assigned to the data. And this is not common. This requires money, resources, and experiences, and time. So the key message is 
that EPOS is committed to preserve uh, scientific data and products uh, to ensure uh, data and service provision. Mm -hmm. This implies uh, to adopt uh, uh, data management plans and to maintain uh, data and services uh, in their own life cycles. Uh, the primary goal is to foster scientific innovation and progress, uh, simply recognize the value of data through the utility and the warranty. So this is the first uh, key message that I would uh, like to deliver you today. Now, come back to the uh, fairness horizon. This is really an horizon you can see it, you can use to walk, but you cannot touch. And the Open Science Agenda contains the ambition to make fair the data sharing by default within 2020, which is almost finished. And this is quite ambitious. And data fairness is considered a necessary target for research infrastructure in different scientific domains at a global level. It can be considered a necessary condition to be funded the, nearly in the future. Now, there is nothing wrong, but the adoption of practices to follow five principles involve suitable technical solutions for data integration and inter interoperability, effective legal solution for data policies, access rules, and licensing of data, effective governance of the integrated data, and to this governance, research infrastructure provide a good solution and uh, a possible framework for governing, but also a financial dimension because open access costs. And we should have already learned about the cost of open access if we analyze retrospectively the experience of open access to publications and scientific literature. This means that uh, turning five principles into practice require adequate uh, human resources and skill, it requires uh, uh, money and solutions. And this is also that when we uh, look at the management plan, the data life cycle, that means collect and archiving the data, what is uh, simply these two steps, uh, he actually involve uh, an entire life cycle, which includes the processing, the visualization, the analysis, the dissemination up to the archiving. So we need to be sure that those people that are putting fire data management into practice, they are aware of the resources and the time that is needed to the community to achieve this task and to adopt the practice in order to fulfill and follow the principles. In particular, if we go come back to solid earth science and to EVOS, we also manage real time services like in seismology, that is an example, uh, we have uh, data collected in real time, which are usually uh, used to locate earthquakes and to measure and uh, understand the ground shaking during large earthquakes, for instance. Seismologists have a long lasting tradition of sharing data and the adoption of open access policies. Data are shared anonymously in real time at the global level. So it's the maximum level of openness that we can. Uh, but in any case, when we go to scientific products uh, like the hazard and risk, these data respond to the uh, commitment that the research organizations have with the civil protection and with the society. Therefore, the key message is uh, the services are necessary to access and to use the data and to the integration. But the real-time services are operated by EPOS without interfering with the institutional commitments and the authoritative role of the research organizations. So it's not EPOS that will start to provide information to stakeholders and societies, because this is a commitment and a duty of the national research organizations that are producing and generating this data. But at the same time, EPOS can uh, help in educating and disseminating the, the contents of scientific research and scientific achievements, as well sharing scientific information. And sharing scientific information is a much, much uh, demanding uh, uh, topic uh, uh, undertaking than uh, data. I, will, I want to conclude uh, showing you a couple of examples on how you can provide example for uh, uh, society. And I will use example from two communities. The first one is satellite. When we collect uh, satellite images in time, we can analyze and process uh, this data in order to measure the interferograms and to measure the ground deformation. 
So we can have time series of deformation. And I will show the example of the Fregrean caldera, the complete Fregrean deformation. So you can see that uh, with time, you can see the color. You see the uplift, which is increasing in time. And this is uh, uh, to analyze this data in time. This data, this time series will be open access and will be delivered to scientists, not only for the monitoring, because the INGV and the Osservatorio Vesuviano are committed to provide the expertise and the interpretation of the phenomena to the civil protection, but this is just for science, for volcanology and deformation. However, when we collect this data, you see that there are many other areas in the map that are red and yellow. If we look at this, for instance, this is uh, simply the subsidence due to the high-speed high railway that connect Naples with Rome. They put so much concrete that now there is subsidence due to the, to the, to the infrastructures. Or another, and you see here the, the trend. Another example is this red area in the, in the Naples uh, area. And you see this here, we are in Pompeii and we are measuring the subsidence of the territory, and this is an archaeological site. So this is an, an imagine in which this is a demonstration that the data collected for scientific purposes, they can be useful for society in a different way. And the second example is the anthropogenic hazard. The anthropogenic hazard and the services for induced seismicity by exploitation of georesources. Now, the safe exploitation of the resources requires the commitment for, uh, by scientists that are monitoring and understanding if earthquakes are induced, triggered, or natural. These are services uh, and the, which will be episodes, uh, which will be collection of uh, anthropogenic activities and uh, seismicity that will be accessible to users. But this implies another point for uh, solid earth science, which is the ethical issues. I don't have time to enter in this, but I want to show you uh, through a graphic representation what is the ethical issues. Ethical issues means to find the balance between three different aspects. Uh, respond to open science, therefore sharing data for science to provide scientific products for seismic hazards or geohazards, and therefore, which implies risk communication, therefore, to society, and also the exploitation of georesources, the interaction with the private sector that should involve a safe and exploitation of georesources and sure for environmental security. And you can imagine that this is the, actually the ethical issues means to be in the, a balanced way among these uh, three points. Therefore, the key message three is that the development of the downstream services to stakeholders has to be sustainable, which means that has to be also ethical issues, uh, especially for the communication and for the provision of information to society and stakeholders. The operation of downstream services by research infrastructure should be imply impartiality for public goodness, means that if a research organization is committed for the monitoring of the territory, you should not have connections with the industry unless there is the national authority of, or a governance framework that can demonstrate the impartiality for public goodness. And finally, the pan-European harmonization of downstream services has to be coherent with national security plans and existing operational services for civil protection agencies. We need to be an added value and not to interfere with the existing commitment with national um, authorities. Therefore, in conclusion, EPOS want to work for providing access, use or reuse, integrated use of data and access to facilities. Our primary commitment is to contribute to understanding by scientific products, processing and modeling and data massive application. And in order to foster discovery, new ideas, authoritative services, training and education. But of course, the possibility to provide the services to society and to the private sector means the trust of the society. And this is the most difficult task for the undertaking of sharing data. Therefore, I would like just to conclude saying that there is a huge amount of work underlying sharing the data, 
but we need to convince scientists, young researchers and students that there is an added value in sharing data and we need to provide the support to the individual researchers and the laboratories to find the resources and the skills and the experiences to share the data. And uh, I think that I can stop here because my time is finished, two minutes more. Thank you very much, uh, Massimo, for this clear talk. Uh, I would like to open up the floor for questions, so please post your questions in the, uh, uh, the chat window. We already have a few. Um, one from Ilya Kokken. In this presentation, you are talking about solid earth data and how already this broad category is so multidisciplinary. In the work in the, I work, she works in a different field, namely paleo-oceanography, which requires even different types of data, metadata. What are your suggestions for starting new integration efforts and how to decide on common metadata fields and terminology, as well as minimal required metadata fields? And how can we motivate? Ah, that, that is a... Excellent question. I can answer uh, saying the following things. Uh, in solid earth science, uh, the intention since the beginning to have a single, a unique research infrastructure for the entire domain. This is different uh, on the present session, for instance, in the atmospheric domain in Europe and in the uh, marine domain, where there are many different research infrastructure collecting um, small or particular data sets. This, uh, from one uh, side, uh, increases the difficulties, but at the same time, it allowed us to try to work on this harmonization process with all the communities together. At the beginning, this was extremely difficult because everyone, they were using data. The risk is when you put together many different people, you have uh, 10 metadata standards and you leave the room with the two metadata standards. You increase the number of organizing. And example is a convincing geologist that OGC is a marvelous uh, metadata standards, but should be integrated by others, for instance, used by seismologists. So, so far we have 15, 14 metadata standards and we have, we have a, a metadata management in which this standard case because you will never convince a single community to renounce to their metadata standards over which they worked for decades and they are using for sharing the data. So the experience is uh, do not impose but try do not increase and therefore we are using uh, DCAT and the Cherif as solutions and the ingestion of the data on the community level to the central lab is, is a huge undertaking, but uh, this is the real uh, challenge. So this is what I would uh, suggest. But that is really, really uh, the question, is the core of the challenge. I think so too. Um, Ilya, if you, want, if, if you want to respond to this, to this response, then I uh, just post a new question in the chat. I'll move on to the next question um, by Kirsten Elviger. Um, Kirsten wants to thank Massimo for his great introduction to EPOS and it's good to see everything is coming together. So what is the relation between EPOS and other similar initiatives like the European Geological Data Infrastructure uh, uh, developed by the Geological Surveys of Europe? Uh, the, the Geological Surveys of Europe uh, participated to uh, are planning to integrate the geological data in EPOS. But integrating the data does not mean that this is another key message. We are not asking data to the communities. We are asking the communities to continue to manage the data. But we then interoperability, they access to their data to other communities. Therefore, we want to make the Geological data repository, which means that a seismologist or a geodesist can find this data simply navigating, and therefore the data are not moved to EPOS. But through the metadata, the user can find this data and go to the 
provider geological data. So just a clarification, not uh, using the geological data. But this is not enough because, for instance, you can have a skilled seismologist that is studying an earthquake. And together with the seismograms, which he is, uh, he, she is very expert to use, he needs the formation. You can access to the free GNSS data. I am uh, an old seismologist. If you give me raw GPS data, I can do nothing because I am unable to process this data because you need the software and expertise. And there are four or five, Bernese, Garmit, and so on. So what Epos is doing, we are providing to the users the solutions, the products. So you will have access to the deformation, to the differences, to the movements of the land. And this will foster a student or a PhD that is working, not be becoming a skilled geodesist, but to have the deformation map on that area and to use it. And if we are able to convince a scientist to share the products of their research, you start a feedback, a positive feedback in which the data products, the scientists became data products providers. This is a long lasting, this is really an and a commitment for the future. But this is what we can uh, try to merge. Therefore, we want to integrate geological data, but we want to provide access to students of uh, products without uh, the expertise necessary to generate and to use these uh, scientific products. Uh, Massimo, uh, I will interrupt just for a second. I will keep the image of Ronald on the, on the, on the meeting. Please close your camera because your internet uh, is a bit... Uh, Okay. It's not to hear you, it's better to, to close the camera. Yeah. Please, Ronald. Thanks, uh, Liviu. Um, thanks, Massimo, for this, uh, for this answer. So I think an important aspect that you are talking about is to make the data findable by having a common vocabulary, but also to make the data interoperable via APOS. Um, Jürgen, you asked um, a similar question, um, whether EPOS is in, in any sense comparable to uh, OSDU, so Open Subsurface Data Universe. Has the question in part been answered already? Mm, not no. quite. Maybe uh, you want to say some more about it. I don't know if you're familiar with that, uh, Massimo. Uh, this is an open source initiative of 150 companies, amongst all of them the uh, yeah, main cloud provider in the world, uh, Amazon, Google, IBM, uh, Microsoft. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, no European uh, cloud provider is part of it. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, it does basically similar things what you're saying or trying to do similar things what you're saying. The answer is yes, but honestly, I'm not sure this is feasible immediately. And this for two main reasons. One is technical. But not technical means uh, legal is legal. I mean licensing of the data. So, so uh, at this stage, we are focusing with the data generated by research, uh, uh, public research uh, uh, institutions and organizations, because we need to find a way to share on a common licensing for the data. Being open access, they should be licenses uh, as open access. But even this with the com creative commons of the by why uh, licensing, there are uh, different uh, use, uh, especially for private. Therefore, we need, we are not imposing in EPOS a single license, but we need to agree with the communities about the licensing. And therefore, this will foster also the sharing with the data with the private sector and with the companies. There, the second one, in this specific example of the sub subsurface uh, uh, data, we would like to do this together with the geological uh, surveys and with the geolo ge geologists together. So it is not EPOS that is approaching a community, but at global level, we are uh, collaborating with other international initiatives, and there are already emphasized that the need to share the uh, data collected for the subsurface geology. Therefore, the, the answer is yes, this is uh, something that we must do, 
but we need again to be pragmatic. And it is not just a memorandum of understanding between EPOS and another organization, which is fine to collaborate, but if, we, you, if you really want to share the data, means that you need to adopt the management of the data, including the licensing that is endorsed. And the licensing is not a complication because uh, since you are collecting the data, you need to protect the data providers. And in the future, with the internet and with the uh, incredible capacity of the of networking, you will be able, any users will be able to download the petabytes of data from the web. But uh, who will distinguish those data that are curated, managed, that are trusted by the, the social mining. We as scientists have dedicated decades to curate this data and therefore now infrastructure like EPOS had the responsibility, has the responsibility to protect the capital value and to make the data uh, traceable and to recognize uh, the accountability and the visibility of the data providers. This is the reason why EPOS cannot enlarge uh, uh, like uh, a bread, because otherwise it will collapse. We need to consolidate the curated integration, and for us uh, at the present, uh, still the licensing and the traceability of data providers is a quite demanding commitment that prevent us to increase the sharing of data. But the subsurface geology, in my opinion, is a mandate also because especially in the areas where there is induced seismicity, anthropogenic hazard, this is the information that has to be integrated together with the, the other uh, data. Okay, thank you, uh, Massimo. Um, this, is, this is great. We've reached the end of the, the time slot, I think. Uh, I would like to thank Massimo for presenting here today and his clear explanation on the European Research Infrastructure, EPOS. Uh, as Massimo mentioned, developing a European Research Infrastructure can be quite complicated uh, because of many governing aspects, but also the different communities and disciplines involved. But once it is fully set up, um, a research infrastructure like EPOS can contribute strongly to a more efficient use of the means available for Earth science, and that means for us all. So Massimo, thanks. Thank Massimo, you very open, much. Open your camera for a final shot. Ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Thank you to everyone. And uh, yeah, it has been uh, a pleasure for me to have this opportunity and to present uh, EPOS and this vision on the data management to all these people uh, attending. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And I would also like to.